Uh, today we've got a very, uh, very interesting topic and a very interesting uh, speaker, and I um, 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 can't wait to get started. Um, we've, in a moment, uh, Professor Fabrizio Carmignani, is the Dean Academic of the Griffith Business School, will come up and do a welcome. And uh, then we'll hand over to Dan to speak for about uh, an hour, a give or take. Um, then we'll have questions and answers. Um, and in about 6.15, there'll be uh, food outside so, um, and, and an extra drink. Um, so that, that's all prepared for. So uh, just letting you know that's, that's the uh, order of events. So without further ado, uh, ado I'd like to uh, invite Professor Fabrizio Carmignani to welcome Dan. Thank you, Hans. Let me start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land of which we are gathering today and pay my respect to the elders past and present and extend this respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, welcome everyone and, and thank you Andreas, you have done already most of the housekeeping that I was asked to do. Um, a couple of things for housekeeping. In case of an emergency, you run out screaming, we are all going to die. Uh, and I will fall. I, I will actually need to charge. No, uh, in case of an emergency, please, we have got the exit, as you can see here in the stairs, and we will meet uh, outside at the uh, meeting point. And uh, if you need the toilets, the toilets are just outside here on the left. Um, now that your speaking is done, uh, let me introduce our guest speaker for tonight, uh, uh, Dan O'Halloran. I'm sorry if my pronunciation <laughs> is still right. not yet there, but I hope I will improve by the end of the day. Uh, Dan, it's a pleasure to have you here tonight, absolutely. Now, I have to write down uh, your list of uh, degrees and, and titles. Uh, Dan holds a Master in Health Economics Policy and Management from NSC. Uh, he also has a Bachelor of Finance in the Bachelor of Commerce from the University of Tasmania. Uh, what is fascinating is that Dan is also, uh, has been a, a CPA, Certified Practice Accountant, for over a decade. Um, and he's a registered pharmacist. And uh, he's also a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. Uh, Obviously, with this type of uh, multidisciplinary experience, Dan has had an outstanding career covering several senior roles, working uh, for multiple multiple levels of government. Uh, I apologize if I forget if I don't mention some of your positions, but he was senior director of COVID-19 analytics for the Queensland government, senior director of systems performance for Queensland Health, and uh, uh, done vet research into costings of home care support in response to the Royal Commission into Aged Care. Uh, uh, Dan also led Australia's first public reports on technical efficiency in Australia's major hospitals. Uh, currently, Dan works in the private sector as Director of Financial and Economic Analysis at Health Consult PTI. Uh, also, uh, Dan has in a general role with us at Griffith. Now, um, tonight, Dan, I, I understand you will be talking to us about the economics of healthcare and particularly understanding the cost of health reforms. Um, if there was any need to convince all of us that resource allocation in healthcare is important, then the pandemic did the job. Absolutely. Um, today, more than ever, I think we. Uh, we see how the, the, uh, an efficient and functioning uh, healthcare is key to the promotion of public good. And um, I don't think that anyone in this room or anyone uh, in, in, in the policy sector can miss the link between public health and economic performance and how the two together uh, uh, are fundamental to the well-being and prosperity of the community. <coughs> uh, this of course, lead to a number of central policy questions about productivity and how to fund healthcare. And while we probably all agree on what I've said so far, well, there is still quite an open and vibrant uh, policy and academic debate on some of the underlying substantive questions, particularly questions around measurement, how we measure cost, how we measure output, 
how we measure productivity. I believe then that tonight you will give us a contribution in, to this debate, a very important one, and uh, uh, possibly that you will, argue, you will argue, or that's what I expect, you will argue for an approach that probably goes beyond the traditional measures such as you know, the health expenditure to GDP ratio. And I really look forward to, to listening to your um, ideas and views. Now, before giving the floor to Dan, let me just acknowledge, obviously, all of you in the room, but in particular, acknowledge the fact that this is, tonight, a, a joint event of different groups and different elements at Griffith. <laughs> uh, I believe that, that it's important that we keep in mind the type of research, the type of engagement that we have in health economics and health policy at Griffith University. Uh, we've got, obviously, the Menzies Health Institute Queensland uh, that undertakes research across life cycle to identify key factors that influence health and also to develop strategies to improve health and well-being for individual families and communities. We've got the Center for Applied Health Economics. Uh, the center brings together health economists, health service researchers, implementation scientists, biostatisticians to conduct multidisciplinary research to deliver leading advice on health policy. And then we have the Department of Accounting, Finance, and Economics, where we have several economists that publish high caliber research on the social and economic determinants of health. I'm really happy uh, as, as an economist, as, as a scholar, uh, in my role as, as, as Dean Academic, to see that all these various elements uh, have come together to support and promote initiatives such as this one tonight. And I'm sure that we will see more and more work. And I'm looking at my colleagues in these different elements now, the back, at the front, in the middle, uh, to encourage you to continue this type of collegial cooperation because I'm sure that it is through this type of collegial cooperation that we, as Griffith, can retain and strengthen our role, our leading role in health economics and health policy analysis. So thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. I'm sure we're going to have a very interesting discussion. Please stay around for drinks and food, as Andreas mentioned after the, the talk. And then thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And the floor is yours now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invite. Uh, more importantly, thank you for attending, because most people can organise these things without your attendance and sort of become a good point. And so, um, also before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the charitable people, traditional owners upon the land on which we meet, their elders past, present, future, and emerging. Um, to acknowledge Hayley Brogan, uh, Queensland's, and also Australia's first chief uh, health officer of the First Nations. Thank you. Um, there is a recording tonight. A number of people nationally wanted to hear what had to be said. Um, and so uh, just to remind you that, that that will continue as we go through questions. Uh, so I apologise that the slides are dense. Um, people said that they wanted something that they could take away. So you can access the slides later if you want to see so. <clears throat> and so, the objectives of what I'm hoping to go through in the next, say, 45 minutes or an hour um, is to sort of introduce Mark Borley. So, Mark Borley uh, was a leading, or still is a leading economist in the United States. He's head of school at Wharton for a number of years. Um, he published what I believe to be a seminal piece of work in health affairs, so in the article in 1993. Um, then, present his work so, to, so that you understand the context. Uh, and then present what I did as my dissertation on the School of Economics, where I updated his work and also updated his methods, but considered that in the context of over a decade. And so he looked at data from 1988, uh, and then what I ended up doing was 2005 to 2015. Uh, and then I said to my wife, I said, oh, I think I've underestimated what I've signed up to for tonight. <laughs> and so I then ended up updating my dissertation with the latest data available after 2015 to the latest publicly available data. Um, so we can actually see that um, more than just a decade uh, across all OECD countries. Um, of that, then touch on points around financial uh, and outcome challenges in the Australian healthcare system, uh, investments around labour market and future productivity, 
a hard argument importance around distinguishing between revenue strategies and outcome strategies uh, and then the concept of equally understanding the difference between technical, elective and dynamic efficiency. I say that and I, I ponder that point because efficiency is often used as a term that's often very much misunderstood and often uh, misused, I believe, in a number of ways. Uh, and so a number of people use the concept of utilisation as efficiency. Um, and as I go through tonight, I hope to challenge that concept that that's not necessarily appropriate. And uh, fundamentally, um, the concept of what I'm wanting to hopefully part on you tonight is that if we don't get this right, um, then I do have a belief that uh, in time we will have the same issues that Angus Deaton has cited as having in the United States, uh, where our children, uh, their life expectancy and their quality of life will be worse than that of their parents and their grandparents. Uh, Martin Wolf, uh, CBE from the United Kingdom, uh, who presented at the Australian Economics Conference in Hobart last week, uh, actually cited that uh, what Angus Deaton has reported in the United States has actually started to happen in the UK. And so I fundamentally believe is that if we don't start understanding some of this, these productivity issues, position payment review, uh, in a number of years, uh, head of school at Walton, uh, and also chief editor for a number of journals, so a fairly distinguished individual. Um, this was his paper that he published in Health Affairs. It was titled uh, The US Healthcare Costs, The Untold True Story. I believe there was a link attached to the invite, so if you want to actually access that paper yourself. A couple of takeaway points of what he really highlighted to challenge, and this was mentioned in the introduction, is health reforms often cited around how much people spend as a percentage of GDP. Um, poorly challenged that as a very uh, poor concept to actually truly understanding what's actually happening and uh, actually called for a moratorium on the use of those sort of calls that we're not spending enough uh, or spending too much as a percentage of overall spend. Um, he called for the need to truly understand the economic costs uh, and what he means by that is the trade-off of uh, how we allocate our labour market. And one of the reasons why he did that is that uh, okay, if we put more people into health and that's actually leading to better outcomes, that's fantastic. But if we're putting more people from our labour market into health, it's not improving outcomes. And that's then taking away from productivity or investment in other parts of our economy. Then you may not necessarily bankrupt your economy, but the quality of life of future generations will be significantly impacted because you will impoverish your community. So whilst you can afford it, the actual outcome of that is that your life, um, your quality of life, um, and what you expect of, of, of what your parents had is unlikely to be the case. And so, um, on that concept, is it's the opportunity costs, um, and then call for the concept of well, how how do you address that? So this was some of the numbers, uh, and so one of the first measures that he used was to say, well how much do people earn in, in healthcare? And so he looked at physicians, and uh, in the United States, the physicians back in 1988 earned about 4.83 times that of the average health worker, and considered that around sort of dis distribution of income and what that actually means. Uh, and his paper was very much around defending the American healthcare system that whilst they spend a large amount, in actual fact, the opportunity costs they have aren't that great. And so when we consider that, this is oh, sorry. When we consider that, uh, when we actually look at the percentage of the labour force, they only had about 7% um, of their labour market, so 7 out of 100 people working in health and social services. Uh, and when they consider that um, on a weighted component of the age between 15 uh, and 64, only about 5%. What was interesting, this was 1988, is that Australia is higher in 1988 than the United Kingdom, and also higher than the United States. And so at that point, he already has identified back in the late uh, 1980s is that Australia already had a higher component of opportunity cost on how we're actually allocating our labour market. If you think about the relativities between this, is that that's not a doubling. That it, that it is about one to three percentage points higher 
when you then consider how much uh, is actually being earned as the average wage, you see that they're now seeing a double, almost a doubling. So 4%, uh, 4.77% for about 70%. So what that means is that whilst in 1988 Australia had a larger proportion of its labour market employed in health and social services, the wages that were paid in that sector were actually on average higher than what was actually being paid in the United States uh, on the point of relativity. So when we consider that, um, he cited, uh, and I think fair to acknowledge, is that one of the limitations of that work is that he assumed that the opportunity cost across all those OECD countries was constant because he used the 4.83 as a measure. And so for my dissertation, I actually updated that to the main bespoke weights. Not only did I use his measure of the 4.83, I then developed bespoke weights to consider uh, what happened over that 10-year decade. The other thing that he really called out is that if you end up having more people working in health and social services as a proportion of your labour market, that will have an impact on your productivity. And so, because what we hear or we'll know from Bormel's um, service cost disease is that uh, sectors that are more reliant or heavily reliant uh, on labour to do the work, they can't be necessarily or haven't been substituted with the technology then you're likely to have a lower amount of um, output for the amount of input that you put in. And that's exacerbated even more if the wages are actually on average higher than the average wage in a society. And so if we think about that, is that even though the Productivity Commission has called for concerns around decreasing productivity in Australia since 1996, I would actually question that the level of productivity has actually fallen faster than what we think. Because what I'll demonstrate um, over the course of the next half an hour is that over that time Australia has had uh, one of the highest growths of OECD countries as a proportion of its labour market and health and social services. And because productivity is often measured by the wages going into that sector, then you end up having what is a similar concept to the housing bubble in the United States. Is that at an aggregate level, everything looked okay, but when you actually looked under the lid and you started seeing what was driving it, you actually saw a very different story. And so what I mean by that is because we've had growth in the size of people employed, uh, the number or proportion of people employed in health and social services, because they earn on average a higher wage, that makes, the growth in that makes the productivity actually looks higher than what it would have been had you not had that growth. And so, um, and then uh, what Paulie highlighted is when he was asked, well, how did the Germans do it? Because they paid for less. It's pretty much the takeaway story. So it comes down to a uh, point of relativity between wages and the extent to which uh, that actually occurs and then the impact of how that causes allocation uh, issues within your actual wealth of your society. So why have I looked at this? Uh, is that if we consider... Um, what the Productivity Commission cited in 1996 is that productivity is decreasing. Uh, and we consider other metrics at the same time as to how many workers in the population um, are working for every one pensioner. That's been decreasing. And so if we go back to 2007 through to 2018, latest data available, um, we see a decline across um, other former Commonwealth countries in the number of um, people in the workforce per pension. So what that means is the burden on fewer is greater because those people working need to then pay higher taxes or a higher proportion of their income to subsidise those services. <coughs> if I put it into context of the timing that I actually did my dissertation, I ended up looking at data up to 2015. So that's why I've given this comparative between 08 and 15 uh, for comparability. Do you actually see that Australia um, was actually almost um, had a, such a decrease in this uh, compared to Canada. Uh, for also these comparisons, I've, I've excluded people that are on the disability pension uh, and anyone that receives a military pension or anyone that receives a uh, war widow's pension. Um, so I thought, take that out because they're, they're paid as a social policy context, so let's just look at comparable other social benefits which are often tied around employment. And so what we see is, yes, we've got a decline. We, we aren't as low as Canada, New Zealand, or the United Kingdom. Um, 
But if that continues, I question whether we then start seeing what Angus Deaton has cited to see. And so, um, so the change since I actually completed my dissertation from 15 to 18 is that we've actually come back up and you see that the United Kingdom has also uh, actually started to turn that around. Now I put this picture in because often people think the old people are the ones holding the hand of the young. What this story actually highlights is if this continues, it's actually the young person holding the hand of the old person because the old person means the young person. And so that's one of the reasons why. And so uh, a lot of this is cited, or the reason for decreased in productivity is primarily because of the reduction in the manufacturing sector. And so, uh, and at the same time, uh, the impact and, and the impetus of, of why productivity is so important is around the world being quality of life. And so, when we consider this as well, what's the relevance of this to the health sector, is each additional person employed in the healthcare sector, as I said before, means they can't be employed in another sector. And so, reiterating, is that if that's happening and that, that workforce is not effectively used, is that a good thing? My view is not. And so my, my argument, um, or premise of the argument is that, okay, if we want more people in that sector employed, then um, it's on the basis that we're actually effectively, effectively using that workforce. And it's then not causing a trade-off of investment in other parts of the economy, because if it is, then um, the impact of that on future generations will be worse. And so, on that basis, is, uh, that's, that's why I want you to focus, to actually ask the question, so has the health and social services sector in Australia actually grown? <clears throat> now, if I think about um, 10 years ago when uh, the National Health Reform, Reform Agreement was being called for and more funding uh, in health services uh, was being called for. We've got records amount of funding in health. We've got record number of people employed in health. All of that was called for because the system wasn't performing. Is it performing? Even after that record amount of investment and with the number of people put in there. And so given that this is actually what is hitting the news, I question whether that is actually working and whether that was the impetus of the problem. And so, <coughs> um, effectively that's the abstract uh, and uh, the impetus of that is that, uh, or the, the method was looking at 27 OECD countries for comparability, as I said, between 05 and 2015. Um, and fundamentally the results uh, was slightly alarming in that the highest growth was reported in Australia, Israel, Japan, Korea, and once again. Uh, and the average uh, health position um, earns about 2.9 times that of the average wage. And so what I did, as I said, I looked at how many um, people were in the sector uh, in 05 compared to 2015 as a head count. I then looked at uh, that in comparison in method two, looking at the average salary that was earned. And so if you're paying higher salaries in that sector, then that's a weighted average cost because those salaries could have been distributed <coughs> in other parts of the economy, which is then for a trade-off of other investment for where that funding is spent. Uh, and then, as Paul indicated, as one of his limitations is he assumed that the opportunity cost uh, was constant. I updated that uh, on the basis of actually uh, calculating the unique opportunity cost for each of those OECD countries. Uh, and the other difference is that he looked at one year, I looked at the decade. And so, measure one, which looks at the index of the head count, uh, Australia reported basically 50% doubling. So 50% more in health and social services employed in 2015 and 2005. Um, similar to Israel, uh, not as high as Japan, even though Japan has a higher or older population. When we consider all these exact method for being updated, and I apologise that this is small, Australia is here, uh, and it shows or reads that 13.8% of the population between 15 and 64 on a weighted average are employed in health and social services. The United States is 11.7, the UK is 11.5. Again, same as what Pauli demonstrated in 1988, Australia has a higher proportion still above those countries employed in health and social services. Uh, when you consider the labour market, 
The labour market compared to the United States is, is very similar, 15.6 to 15.9. What that therefore suggests is on a point of relativity is that it's something to do with the amount of salaries that have been paid in that sector. Uh, when you then consider the change, and, and the change I have to look at for comparability across most of these um, 27 OECDs, 11 to 15, uh, 2011 to 2015, you see that okay, most OECD countries in that sample grew by about five points, Australia grew by 11 points. The only other countries that were higher was Israel, Korea, Luxembourg. So Australia was in the top five of growth during that decade period. When you then consider that for bespoke weights, and so this actually looks at the relative wages paid to the average wage in that economy, um, I've calculated this using GP wages and specialist wages. What's interesting is that a lot of people compare us to the United States, uh, UK. Uh, one of the interesting points that I take away from this um, is that there is a difference in these systems. Australia has about a 50-50 mix between GPs and specialists. The NHS has about a 30-70 split. Okay? And so, which is heavily weighted. Um, one of the other things to be cautious for anyone that's looking at this later is that Australia um, has a washout of that 2.9 uh, times because we include the training wages which are lower. So if you excluded that, it would actually be higher. And on that basis, it probably would be higher than the UK. And so uh, what it basically highlights is that of the sample of the 27 OECD countries, Australia is actually paying um, above um, higher wages on a median basis. When we then consider what that means on a bespoke opportunity cost, Australia 12.6%, US 12, UK 10.9, there's New Zealand 10.4. Again, Australia's higher, and then when you consider labour, 14.5% change here in the United States. So Paulie was right, is that he's, he's assumption that you needed to have bespoke weights needed to be changed, and it tells you a slightly different story. But what it does highlight is Australia is still paying more than the United, United Kingdom. And so what that suggests is that the imbalances between that, then when you consider the growth, Australia is still um, one of the highest. So, as I said, there's fewer people in the workforce um, today per pensioner than there was a decade or more ago, which means burden on fewer is greater, and we now have a growing workforce and a growing proportion of that workforce. Um, when we then consider that, uh, is that we also need to be mindful is that when we build more infrastructure, that means we employ more people. And so if we've already had growth and higher growth relative to other OECD countries since 1938, and we see that from 05 to 2015, and then I'm about to demonstrate that it's still the same since 2015 to today, is that as we build more, we employ more, which means that this situation is likely to us exacerbate. And so this is more recent data, um, comparisons 2010 to 2017. Australia is here. So on the y-axis we have index growth in the total labour force. So yes, Australia has, has a larger amount of people working today, uh, or 2017 than it did in 2010. So what that basically means is that there's about 110 people working today compared to 100 people um, back in 2010. But when you consider that, um, there's been a significant distribution of pushing into health and social services. And Australia's out here as a, as a growth in that centre. When you then consider this um, of the indexed Index growth in civilian uh, labour workforce, so growth uh, in, the, in the proportion of civilian workforce in that sector. Australia, again, is higher than most OECD countries, again, uh, has had a higher growth. So it sits out here. When we then consider what this means on a head count, so often people say well, we need to employ more people because we have geographical diverse, we need to have services in regional communities. Yes, we do. But when we consider density uh, per 1,000 persons employed, we're one of the highest, again, really, because there's a significant number of countries uh, in this pocket 
uh, is really only Germany has hired into Luxembourg, Switzerland, Netherlands, Finland, and Sweden. And so, at the same time, you've had a percentage of the labour force sitting up here with the United States. Higher than the UK, higher than Canada, higher than New Zealand. When we then consider index growth in density, so growth in that density uh, per 1,000, Australia sits up here towards the head of pack, uh, and then index growth uh, per health and social services labour force again towards the head of pack. So takeaways is that we have more people per 1,000 people employed in health and social services than the United States, UK, Canada, New Zealand, France, Ireland. Australia was reported as one of the OECD countries that had the highest growth in density. That was reported in 1988. I've demonstrated that between 2005 and 2015. And should someone then say, oh, that's changed, you can see the latest data from 2010 to 2017. We also have um, more than the US. Um, as a proportion, uh, and the question is, is this likely to impact productivity? I believe it is, yes, I believe it does. So, <clears throat> there's multiple ways to look at the same problem, um, but as I sort of alluded to before, I actually think this is a double whammy effect, because whilst there's calls that productivity is actually decreased, I actually think that it's decreased even more than what it's reported. Because if you actually accounted for the growth uh, in the number of proportion of people employed in health and social services, because they, they earn on average higher wages, then that productivity is likely to be long. And so, at the same time, there's a significant variation around sort of how much we pay. So, do I think this is a problem? Yes, I do. I think this is primarily a problem around maybe not necessarily bankruptiveness. But I do think it's a problem that will potentially impoverish us as we move forward. And so, when I think about the challenges, and I presented um, anyone that's seen uh, a presentation when I was the Senior Director of Persistent Performance in Queensland Health, I talk about um, balancing safety and quality, appropriate access, not just access, but appropriate access, and funding. Performance is the balance and trade-off of those three things in the relationship thereof, and the interdependencies between that. The reason is, is because when you have quality and safety issues, people can't access the system. Because when someone's harmed, you will on average place five people on the ramp or place five people on the waiting list. And guess what? You had actually already paid that because you gave the funding, but now you have to pay for it again. So it's a double whammy effect. And so when people say, I need more funding, is it actually a revenue or is it a cost issue or is it an effectiveness issue? And so if you're running a revenue strategy, you're over here. Now if you're running a revenue strategy, what's the observed behaviours? So the behaviours is that you hold on to the patient. Because if I transfer the patient to somewhere else, then I lose the activity. That leads or can lead to poorer outcomes for the patient. If I'm not referring, particularly if I'm not referring patients to quaternary or tertiary centres. And so, particularly if I'm not doing it in a timely manner. And the other thing is, uh, I may be encouraged to deliver low value care um, because I can actually deliver the care, but that doesn't mean it addresses your presenting complaint. Which means that we do more, it costs more, but doesn't actually address the problem of the person that came for the help. If you're over here, you're writing an outcome strategy. Because what you're actually saying is I actually need to refer people quickly to other centres. I'm looking at quality and safety and I'm looking at appropriate access. There's a lot of conversation about waiting lists. The only requirement to get on a waiting list is to get a referral. So when you're on the waiting list, if I'm on the waiting list, and I can access care very quickly, that there is actually a poor alignment between what I need and the waiting list that I'm on. That's ineffective. Because it means that someone else can't get in. It becomes an allocation issue. If there's a high need that I'm on the waiting list for a long time, it's also ineffective. And so the sweet point is actually in the middle where you want timely access where there's a high need, 
and you actually want to have uh, low access where there's a low need, which means how do we improve the allocation of the referral process onto the waiting list? It's not just I need to clear the waiting list because who on the waiting list should or shouldn't be there. And so do GPs actually have information to enable them to do or inform that? I don't believe they do. Do I believe they could have information that enables them to do that? Yes, I believe that that exists, but is it available to them? No, it's not. And so when we consider the financial challenges, is that Australia in 1920 spent over 200 billion on health. So someone made the decision for all of us, each of us, uh, for the taxes that we pay, about $8,000 per person someone spent on our behalf. Uh, that was about 24 cents in a dollar, increasing to about 20 cent, 26 cents in a dollar during the pandemic. Most of that would have gone to labour, um, and the majority of the cost in both primary care and hospitals is labour. But despite uh, this investment, uh, we have continued calls that the system is not actually performing. And so we have waiting list issues, we have ambulance ramping, and sadly we have people dying. And so uh, they don't have choice. And so our premise of, of today's presentation is I believe we need to enable choice and I believe we need to enable competition. Because that, these statements at the bottom are, uh, are from a colonial inquiry. This gentleman uh, went to a hospital. That hospital was receiving uh, a number of patients from another hospital that had a COVID outbreak. The colonial report read that he then was instructed to drive an hour to the next hospital. He presented. He died or was found dead in the bathroom. And no observations were taken on him for 40 minutes. My argument is, is that if private hospitals and private emergency departments could access the same funding for emergency department services as the public emergency department services, he would have had choice to go to the private ED. If he had that choice, instead of waiting all that time, maybe the outcome would have been different. And so I'm going to give you three examples of how I believe we can create competition in the system. I presented as the problem are presented as a way of enabling or addressing the problem and how that I believe that would actually address productivity and efficiency. And so the first one is actually addressing uh, emergency department ramping. At the moment, if you have ambulances ramped, what that means is that you also need the ambulance to maintain a response time. If you're not being able to maintain the response time, I then need to employ more paramedics to look after the patient in the ED before they transfer the care. By employing more paramedics to do that, am I effectively using the additional labour that I've taken from another part of the labour market? At the moment, when you're put in the back of an ambulance, they take you to a public emergency department. Do they have choice? Not really. Is there competition between hospitals? No, because they primarily go to the closest PD. So, do hospitals work as a system? I don't believe they do, because they primarily go to the closest. And what proportion of ambulances are actually admitted to a ward? Let's say 30%. That means 70% of people that arrive by ambulance, theoretically, could have gone to a private ED, even if the private ED wasn't actually admitting them. And so, if you did that as a potential solution, where the ambulance had choice to go to a public ED, a private ED or increase their scope of practice, there's improved choice, there's competition, and you can streamline. There's, there, are, there is a major city in Australia at the moment where the private ED is closed on weekends, that is latent capital capacity, latent uh, staff, yet the public hospital, which is less than probably five or ten minutes down the road, is ramping ambulances and helicopter ambulances. And so the question I have is do you then build a larger public ED? Is that an efficient use of public funds? Or do you enable competition to say something's happening here because we're not optimising the private ED capital and we're not um, using the private ED um, labour market? If they were able to access the same funding, 
could that potentially improve performance? And I believe it would. Would that also address an allocation issue, which I think is leading to most of these issues, is fundamentally I believe we have an allocation issue problem. And so how do we encourage choice and competition to address the allocation? The second example is between EDs and GPs. <clears throat> if I have an upper res respiratory tract infection, and I go to the GP, and they have a long consult, they'll get paid about $76. If I go to the ED, they get paid about $490. Is there a willingness to pay argument there? I don't know if I would pay $490 to go to the ED for that, in my view. I'm not saying that we should pay the GP $490. But on that basis, is there a incentive for the GP to say, actually, no, I need to scale up my services to see this patient. If I'm only getting $80 and they're getting $490, I might as well let them go to the ED. And so the potential solution there is instead of just looking at historic costs and historic activity and washing them over each other to legitimise what we pay in the future, my argument is that maybe we should be having a willingness to pay conversation to say, would, are we actually willing to pay for that at that price? The third example is around waiting list management and delivering patient-centred care for patient-centred information to deliver outcomes. At the moment, the funding mechanism is, a, is based around the provider. It's not based around the patient or their outcome. And so, in this journey of care, each one of these points gets paid. So, in my example, where I've been referred and listed to a waiting list, and I've had an intervention, if that was inappropriately allocated or there was for whatever reason I, I went on that pathway and I'm like, that actually didn't address my problem, I then just get relisted and I then have another intervention. That increases utilisation. It means I have to have more people employed, but did it deliver an outcome? So my argument is, why are we measuring all these touch points? Because what are we purchasing or what are we trying to achieve? Is it this that we're trying to achieve or is it actually the outcome that we're trying to achieve? And so when we consider this as a funding of the system to be patient-centred care, I believe this is the definition that the outcome what we're choosing. Now, others have reported this similarly with chips, right? Smith chips. Looks the same, but it was different uh, in 2010. You used to get 200 grams, now you get 175. You used to have one packet and you used to be full. I'm, not, I'm still hungry, so I'm eating out of the pack. You don't eat 10% of the next pack, you eat the whole thing. So you just continue to consume, right? And so the question is, is that it looks the same, but it's counted differently. And so how other three possible solutions to this is changing the definition of an, of an outcome where you bundle this to say I'm paying for a pathway of care because uh, I actually want to encourage the outcome. This also goes to the point is encouraging quick and efficient transfer to tertiary and quaternary services because I'm paying for the outcome as opposed, as opposed to holding the patient because I need the activity in my facility. The other thing is improving access to information GPs. So I said, I said before, does the GP have information to enable them to make a fully informed decision on which pathway to send to that patient for the ideal outcome? I don't believe they do. I believe the data exists, though. So York University um, uh, developed a program called After My Surgery, democratising information that allowed a GP to have a conversation with you that for your presenting complaint, these were options that could be addressed for your presenting complaint based on your age, your sex, your comorbidities and other characteristics that we have in the data. On average, 10% of people actually had their problem addressed. Right? And guess what? 60% of people had these other side effects and harm. That allows you to have informed choice. At the moment, what you do is you get a waiting list and you're like, I'm on the waiting list. If you had that information with a GP to enable them to engage with you about that conversation, about, okay, 
If I give you the referral, you're starting this pathway. For you, it is probable that the outcome will be this, and the outcome or risks associated with this, then maybe you wouldn't have the referral. Would that improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of having that referral on the wait list? I believe it would, because it would ensure that I'm on the right list, and it would also ensure there's an alignment between what you're going to deliver me and what I think I'm going to get out of it. Because if I'm not going to get out of it what I thought you were going to give me, guess what? I come back to you and I ask you to put me on another way. And so the focus around safety culture and reducing harm, as I said, others have reported this. This has been reported a number of times. When people are harmed, people stay longer. That means I already paid for patients to be treated. And now they're on the waiting list and I'm paying for it again. It also means you need more staff. The other thing, um, too, is around, I added these slides earlier this week. In the last week, I've had this said to me twice. A clinician delivers care that they're comfortable with and proficient at. Is that patient-centred? So if there's two options, and I'm proficient at this, and you're proficient at that, well, I'm going to provide this service, and you're going to provide that service, but what if B is preferred outcome? If I'm paid on activity, well, okay, I can say to you, well, I'll have a crack at it, see how you go. Well, having that is likely to lead to this situation where, okay, someone's paid for the activity, but I didn't actually get the outcome I wanted, so I then go back to have something else done. And so, on that basis, is that how do we address asymmetry of information between provider, funder and patient? Because if we don't address that and we, have, uh, and we don't ensure that we have patient-centred care uh, and informed knowledge around what is going to be delivered in the, on that journey, then I believe all that does is increase utilisation. And I don't believe fundamentally do not agree that utilisation is consistent with efficiency. Because I believe that if you are efficient, you are also effective and it allows um, a need to be met. So having a provider um, provide option B could actually lead to worst outcomes. So I need to clarify this. I'm not saying we force me who's proficient at delivering option A therapy. I'm not saying force me to deliver B because I'm not proficient at it because that would lead to um, safety, right? But at the moment, is the funding system encouraging me to change so that I then become proficient to provide therapy under B that you all provide? If it was an outcome-based funding system, there would be an economic incentive for me to transition. At the moment, I don't believe there is any incentive for me to transition. This is where I believe there is a role for health economists. Some I mentioned before is that, yes, we have studies in clinical trials, but the thing is we actually have huge amounts of data in our healthcare systems based on the experience. <coughs> I've said before and I'll say again, I do not need to survey a patient on their experience when I can see that they've bounced in and out of the system a dozen times, they've had infection, they've had a fall. I can see that in the data. So about how do you link that up until that story? Um, what does this then mean uh, for health investment uh, impacts on labour and productivity? Well, <coughs> we build more beds, means we require more staff. Excuse me. <coughs> and so if you're running an infrastructure agenda, it also needs an operational plan because how are you going to staff it? And based on what I've already demonstrated since 1988, if we do intend to staff it, then when are we having a serious conversation about the productivity and the intergenerational impacts of actually doing that? Because I don't believe you can actually have those conversations in isolation, because I believe they're inherently related. The other part is, well, what is the solution? I believe that we have technology. I believe that we don't use technology enough to enable that. Because I don't think we use our data in the ways that we should. 
one of the best things that I think has come out of the National Health Reform Agreement is the idea of actually linking inter-jurisdictional data to enable us to look at the entire pathway of a patient so that we're not just looking at it from particular lenses. Um, the other thing is, if you want to stimulate an economy and you want Keynesian economics, then let's build infrastructure that actually moves people quicker because we already know uh, that people are spending longer on the eastern seaboard in Australia sitting in their cars and having less discretionary time getting to and from work today than they did a decade ago. That would stimulate your economy because you're building, but you're building something that doesn't require a future labour market, which means that you can then have, you then have choice in the future on where you will then make that investment. <coughs> Technical, allocative and dynamic efficiency. If anyone ever talks to you about efficiency, ask them what they mean, please, because most people don't actually understand it. And they think it's just that I do more. But if I'm doing more but it's not effective, then what's the point of doing it? And so technical efficiency, in a layman's way, considers, well, for how much money I put in, this is what I get out. One of the challenges, and I say this as the person that led Australia's first technical efficiency reports for Australia's largest public hospitals, we're the only federated country in the world to ever do that across all of its jurisdictions. Canada did it, but they didn't do it across the lot. We did, and we did it for a number of years. The person that led that and understands that in detail, having led it, is that that output is utilisation. It is not outcomes. Having uh, had the opportunity to work in Queensland Health and be responsible for system performance for almost half a decade, my view is that it should no longer be utilisation. I believe the denominator of that should be outcomes. I believe that's what we should be targeting. That would then lead to an allocation issue being fixed and you would have allocative efficiency. It would also lead to having dynamic efficiency, which is basically robbing Peter to pay Paul, where you're basically pinching off your kids. And I believe unless we have a serious conversation, then that's basically what we're doing. I believe that you can have all three at the same time, but it means you have to have a very mature conversation and a strategic conversation. The issue is, is that a lot of the problems that are had are localised, which means if we're going to actually do this, there has to be local responses. It's not just one size fits all. <coughs> Balancing the financial and economic outcomes. People often get scared by this. Well, if I take that away, you're going to turn off my income. So what am I going to replace with it? You're going to bankrupt me. Is there a demand for help? Yes. Are there waiting lists? Yes. Is there ramping going on? Yes. So if I stop doing something, is there going to be something else to replace it? Yes. In most places. The problem is, is the allocation. If I turn off what I serve, is that actually what's needed? That's the difference, right? That's the challenge and the issue in health. And I've said this to, to a number of people. If you're running uh, main roads as a secretary, you employ engineers. If you are the secretary of health, you employ 60 to 100 odd different professions, right? Significant number of diversity within that. It's a, it's a mini economy. So. It's not substitutable. So if we're going to actually have a conversation around how you replace it, then it means there has to be a, a strategic conversation around, well, if the demand actually isn't there for my service, then how do I tr transition to have me somewhere where my service is needed? Technology could enable that, or enable me to be retrained to deliver something that is actually in need. Which means, again, it's a very much a considered conversation. It's not just saying, add more. And same with potentially preventable hospitalisations. And so, um, if we don't address these two things, and we just employ more people, I don't think it's effective use of our labour. Balancing the financial and economic outcomes. 
We've had technical gains. We've seen technical gains. What I mean by that is you, we improved the optimization of what we said we delivered. So if I go back to when ABF was initially implemented, that was our data. Then someone, and we set up a funding system for that. Then that person said, well, actually, no, that data is not reflective of what I do. I actually do all this. It's much more complex. I didn't get more funding for it. Technical improvements. I didn't actually do anything differently. And so, yes, you can do that for so long that at some point that comes to a head because I can't actually count things or improve my data anymore, which means the squeeze starts to happen because I've had price escalations on 70% of my cost. Which means you then have to have a conversation about how do you do things differently. <clears throat> you just can't turn around and say I fund it differently, because that just legitimizes the same problem for the next year. <clears throat> so what would be, and this is um, I think only reasonable for me to say this, is okay, so what would you do about it? There's no point in me saying, okay, we have a problem without actually saying what do I think you can do about it, right? And so what would be a five-point action plan? I'd allow private EDs access to Commonwealth Health funding. It would enable choice for ambulances and the population. That would also encourage competition, because private EDs can say, well, if you've got ramping, I can open up and I could take that. That would also then encourage improved information to the client or the patient to actually say, well, actually, I could go to this ED and I'll wait four hours, or I could go to this ED and you see me too. I could increase the scope of the practice of paramedics because at the moment, as soon as a patient is placed in the back of an ambulance, they have to take them somewhere. But if you actually enhance the scope of practice of the paramedics, then maybe you would empower them to actually make a clinical decision to treat you or provide an alternative access pathway. Both of them, I think, would actually improve the use of the labour market in both of those sectors and improve the use of that capital that's invested in health and social services. I'd also implement a hybrid funding model that actually looked at outcomes. So, for example, instead of looking at every episode of care, actually say, what is the pathway of care that I want for a child for the first 1,000 days? And I only pay you that if you've actually delivered all the things that I think you should deliver for that child in the first 1,000 days. Localised responses. Why localised responses? Is because the ramping issue at my facility could be very different to the reason why you're ramping. Mine could be because I have a public health crisis in my community. Yours could be because you have bed block because of aged care in your services. Having one response to those two things of just adding more stuff, I don't think actually delivers you return on investment. Because you actually haven't asked what is the cause of the problem. And so the fundamental thing that I'm saying, we actually need to use data to understand the cause of the problem. The other part is delivering outcomes. Efficiency um, is not a dirty word, but it's often seen as a dirty word. Uh, it's often uh, very much misused. It would be remiss of me not to make comment um, on what's in the public media or what's been cited locally. <clears throat> so this is an extract from uh, Seven News, uh, where a local uh, physician uh, basically called for more staff. It's definitely not enough. That may be true in that person's facility. Had I only, had I stayed uh, and only ever worked clinically and only ever worked in one system and you saw, and that was your reality, your experience is your reality, and you then, because if I explain around how you're taught as a healthcare professional, is that you are taught your health profession, you're not taught the health system. So on that basis, you're actually not taught the interdependencies of all the points of interaction and how that's impacted. And so had I just been a pharmacist, I would probably say, yeah, I need more staff, because that is my reality. But having had the opportunity to work in multiple health systems, having had the opportunity to have the career that I have had, I have a different view. 
And that because it provides a different perspective on, on how those interdependencies and relationships exist. And so, whilst that may be true in one facility, it doesn't mean that's true across the entire system. The other thing to that um, is we already have, as I've demonstrated, significantly more staff than we did. Yet we still have the same problem. Um, not everyone's experience is the same. And do I believe that patients and ambulances have the information to make the best choice? No, they don't. We saw that in COVID. We saw lines and lines of people lining up to get swapped. Did they have information to say, well, actually, if I drove another five minutes, could I have actually been swapped quicker? Did you have that information? Did, you ha did anyone have the information to then identify as a system in actual fact, you need to be swapped first? That would be operating as a system. That would address an allocation issue. And I fundamentally believe that the problems that we face today are an allocation issue. Because I don't believe it's a funding issue, and I don't believe that it's a labour issue. It's the allocation of that labour and how we actually use that labour. Um, and I think we need to think differently. Um, because if we don't, um, then I think that what we have now, today, uh, what's been called for since 1996, where we continue to cycle the productivity issue, I actually think it's worse. The only people who are going to um, be worse off for that is our children. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, Dan. That was a true, uh, I think, tour de force. Uh, you had a bit of everything there. You had a bit of macro, you had a bit of micro, you touched on the experts problem, how do people know, you know which uh, physicians to choose, talked about structural change, um, so that was uh, absolutely fascinating, um, uh, given your background and the work that you've done. Um, we now have time for a few questions and answers, um, uh, um, just for while people are gathering their thoughts. Dan, let me kick things off by asking you this. You talked about allocated efficiency and um, you know, really at the, at, at the heart of what you're talking about is, is you know, getting people to, you know, uh, to, what, to sort of talk about what their preferences are. You can see that in the data. Um, but at the same time, you, know, you, could, you could also see that um, part of the growth, the long-term growth might be this typical structural change that you see across many economies where they move their consumption from food yep. to manufacturing to services. Yep. Um, uh, and I guess in, uh, in the States, you know, they've got this triple aims approach, which kind of, it, I think it echoed a little bit of what you were talking about, where you measure preferences. You don't just go for output, but you measure preferences, you, you measure costs. To what extent has that been successful towards put, getting new systems thinking into, into these kind of issues? Yep, um, a lot in that. Um, so, uh, call me up if I don't uh, address what, you, what you're exactly after. <clears throat> the, so, Triple A has been around for a while. Um, that does talk about cost, it talks about delivering the right care at the right patient, the right time, first time, every time, by the right mm -hmm. resource. Um, the, the concept around that is, well, what do you define as cost? And I suppose that's the biggest lesson I've had in the last eight years. Because if I take myself back when I worked at the National Health Performance Authority, we were looking at cost of an episode of care. My view today is to improve the allocation of that decision making, is that I think the cost should actually be for the outcome. Because if we continue to cost for the episode of care, then we will just do more. You talk about preferences, um, there's preferences by the provider, there's preferences by the patient, and if we really want to encourage patient-centred care, I believe we need to enable choice. I believe that the only way to enable choice is to provide information that enables someone to say these are the outcomes. Now, at the moment, some would argue that, okay, 
refer my patient, I tell them the risks of the procedure. But when that happens, that is that individual providing that product. Mm. It's not us all providing the same product and then saying, well, you might provide a different component to the same problem. It's around how do we look at, well, what are the two outcomes for that head to head? Don't do that. And so uh, until we do that and actually understand outcomes data, using the data from the system, then I don't believe we actually have a system that's learning from itself. And so if we're not learning from ourselves and using the data to learn and transition, then we just continue to do the same thing. And what we then continue to do is then train a workforce to do exactly what I did. But then we expect the outcome to be different. I don't know how that computes. All right, let's move to questions from the floor. I'm sure there's a lot of people with a lot of questions. Uh, Uwe. Thank you very much, Uwe Ludek. Um, then we had a lot of discussions about the role of experts and, and Andreas talked about it. Uh, I find it quite interesting when you start talking about the outcome-based system, sometimes you could think about the diagnosis-related groups. And I currently read actually quite interesting uh, book around interactions with uh, health professionals, where the focus was how to actually spend the right amount of time on the diagnosis, so trying to find out what a patient needs, and, and then we usually cut that short, because more or less, I think very similar to the funding rules you talked about, you show up to, uh, uh, to an emergency room and they have an interest, interest to put you on a, like they call it in the book, a cookbook approach, a patient pathway that is clearly defined so that you can have actually outcome success. Right? You show up there, you say, I have a little bit of chest pain, I put you on the heart attack um, um, a pathway and I can let you out later on because you didn't really have a heart attack so the problem is solved. Right, but maybe the problem was a different one, and um, um, you just get over that. How, how would you be able to, to address that problem? Right, I think um, an outcome will be most likely dependent on how you enter the pathway. Um, do you just aggregate? Is that um, what I heard? Uh, and you know, that way you, you catch the system, so you want to move away from individualized funding. So, so there's three parts to that. Around the DRG system, for those that aren't familiar, DRG is diagnostic related group. Diagnosis is not an outcome. And so they're not synonymous. Um, that's the first point that I'd make. Second part to that, um, as you mentioned, around, around pathway and someone that I had lunch with today, they called it a labeling issue. Um, and it is around if you don't actually have the right information at the beginning, then people will end up on, on a pathway. It's very hard once they do that to get out. And so if we are going to have, which I would advocate for, pathways for outcomes, which is not a diagnostic, that's a diagnostic, is not an outcome, uh, is that we need to be really careful around how do we actually triage or stream those patients in the beginning. How can you resolve that is that you end up having multidisciplinary teams that are responsible for the care of an individual or contribute to the discussion about the individual. And so I've heard situations um, recently, I've seen two juris three jurisdictional systems in, in Australia with the same patient recently, is that two systems, it was delivered, the care was delivered by one provider so it was about what you are comfortable to deliver and what you are comfortable to deliver. Third system had a patient-centred approach where there was a team. The team discussed, particularly for very complex cases, that individual and debated to get some consensus around what they then did for that. And I believe the specialist services where today we have much, we, we do have more complex patients, they are more comorbid. Uh, the more 
morbidity of those patients is greater, then the only way to address that is that if you want to have a specialised workforce, then the only way to actually have patients and outcomes is that that specialised workforce works together for that patient. Because otherwise you go back to a generalist model. Very hard to have both of them in the same mindset, right? But you could achieve the outcome by having a specialist workforce, but it works as a team around the patient to have that discussion. Is that facilitated at the moment? Not necessarily. I remember having conversations with clinicians a number of years ago where I said, well, for these patients that have a cardiovascular disease, and it's a trade-off, right? So cardiovascular patients, we want to reduce their risk of cardiovascular disease, we give them a stack, okay? That reduces cholesterol, but when we reduce cholesterol, it increases the incidence of diabetes. At the same time, you then have kidney challenges. So I said, well, around a patient-centered approach, because you know that it's going to happen and trade-off, um, why don't we bundle that to actually have a conversation around what we do about this? And I know because I deal with this. Patients discharge and then they get a referral, so this person then comes back in and get funded, and they go out and I get another <coughs> referral and I bring them back in. Is that productive? If you count utilisation, yes. If you count outcome, probably not. And so it comes down to, well, how do you measure it? Now, that then goes to funding. There is no funding system that is, that is perfect. You just can't, and I don't believe one size fits all. And what I mean by that is that you have fee-for-service, transactional basis, you have activity-based funding, which under the current definition is pretty much fee-for-service, just labelled activity-based funding. Uh, you could change activity-based funding to be an outcome, which would be then a different definition of that. The other is block funding, which I just say I give you X amount of million, sort it out. Now, if I go back to, say, the 1990s, where we had block funding of particular services, then that encouraged difficult conversations to basically say, there's too much demand coming to my facility, so I then need to partner with people to offload some of that activity. Under a fee-for-service model, or the current ABF model, is there any incentive to do that? No, please just line up because I'll get through you when I need to because income comes in. And so my point to that is that we need to actually consider how the system interacts and then say, well, what is the outcome we want from each of those parts and then choose the most appropriate funding system for the outcome we actually want. Uh, Josh. Yeah, thank you. Um, First, just a fantastic presentation. So, so grateful to have you here and a lovely night, Santa. Um, covered so much topics. Uh, really, a big supporter in terms of um, looking at a denominator of outcomes, right? That's what we're here for. And the and everything else. The and support there. I guess just to be annoying and challenging. <laughs> uh, the first one, I guess, would be around the private health insurance and looking at allowing um, the public patients into private facilities in the ED. I would probably argue potentially that the patients already made the choice. And that choice was when they bought private health insurance. So by subsequently providing more subsidies to private insurance at the point of care, so when they actually are at the ED, it's kind of this bailing out sort of scenario, right? So I guess my point here would be whether or not that is a viable solution, or whether or not we're just sort of forgetting a prior choice made at a rational point in time, um, and then trying to overcome it at a you know, more emergent sort of period. And I guess the uh, current funding for private health insurance at EDs, I think there's an out-of-pocket cost of about 500 to $800, and ambulance officers often will ask patients, do you have private cover? Um, it's just that they'll say no, knowing that there's a five day and go out of pocket cost to the Right. So I guess, you know, a few issues in that sort of scenario that we can think through. Um, the other one was, I guess, the second example around the GP. So this was a, a common sort of scenario where we thought well, all these people were turning up to the ED when they could have gone to the GP. Uh, GP's $35, um, GP's 400 bucks. Again, oh, it's a great inefficiency. 
So, um, so thank you, um, because it allows clarity to be provided. So the first thing that I'd like to do around clarity is that there is often a confusion between insurer and provider. Okay, so that's the first point, is that what I put up here around uh, enabling a private hospital to be receiving funding from the public insurer to a private ED is completely moot of any argument about private health insurance because it is a payment from the public health insurance. So at the moment, if you go to a private ED, you can only access that. Uh, actually, your private health insurance doesn't cover it. It only covers elective surgery. So private EDs are completely out of pocket. And so out of what I've presented is I'm not advocating that you have to access your private health insurance. I'm advocating that private providers can access the funding from the public insurer. So that's one point. The second point around choice is that I don't believe I have any choice for private health insurance because I overpay more tax. That'd be the same for the majority of the people in this room, not making assumptions around how much you earn. But the reality is, is that I either pay tax or I pay private health insurance. And I know which one will give me choice is that I'd rather have private health insurance because at least I have the choice, otherwise I pay the tax, I have no choice. And so um, the concept around that is that I think that's a, that it is effectively a tax. Okay? Um, there is uh, an interesting challenge that we have because there's two, two insurance pools. There is the public insurance pool and the private insurance pool and there's public providers and private providers 
and the mix, match, and what they can access is very different. If you have an interest in that, I recommend you read the DECA review that was done in the Netherlands that considered the, a consolidation of insurances so that insurances can actually access a full amount. But if you want competition, you need to have public and private providers that can access both funding mechanisms. And what that would then mean is your public provider and private provider can equally access private insurance and access public insurance. At the moment, and I question whether there is competitive neutrality in how we currently fund public hospitals, because the public hospitals can access both insurance pools. The private hospital can only access one insurance pool. Does that equal competitive neutrality? In my view, I don't think it does. Um, the other thing is, if we actually um, enable the private provider EDs to access the, pri the, pri the, the public insurer funding and address that allocation issue, or what I would call an allocation issue, would that actually reduce private health insurance costs? Yes, I think it would. Because that example that I gave you in a major metropolitan city where the, public, uh, where the private ED is closed on a weekend, it's got sunk amount of labour, sunk amount of capital, you've then got the public ED ramping uh, helicopters and got ambulances ramped up outside. If you moved that activity over by enabling the private ED um, neutrality and competition by accessing the public insurer funding, that potentially would then wash those costs over more activity, which potentially could actually flatten the growth in private health insurance. Um, your other point around <coughs> choice. Your point around regional and metropolitan centres is the issues are different, vastly different, and they change over time and can change in the tipping point as soon as one GP leaves the community. Now, when I have recently rang up and other people decide the same issues, should get a GP appointment? They say go to the ED. My argument is, uh, if there was a better willingness to pay consideration between what they could have earned from me, that would have an economic incentive for them to probably see me. That's the argument that I'm making. Um, now, with hybrid funding models between Commonwealth and State, do I believe that you could enable hybrid funding models even though there's no change to Commonwealth funding? Yes, I think you could. I think you could be smart about how you want to do that because if you don't, your trade-off is that you have to pay for more capital. And if you have to pay for more capital, guess what? You have to pay for more staff. And so I don't think that it's, I think it's very easy to just say that it's someone else's fault that I'm in this situation. I think we all have a responsibility to engage in how we can. And so I welcome your question because it allowed me to have uh, the opportunity to provide clarity on some very important ish points which I think are often confused or misunderstood. So thank you. Uh, last question. Yeah. Sorry for a long response, yeah. but it was a long question. Um, yeah, yeah, I just did not know how to ask this question, and it goes to some of what you just talked about. How do you define choice? Because there are some people that are living in certain circumstances that don't have a choice. And the way you answer that, I think I agree. But even in a privileged position, we don't have a choice necessarily because of the way our tax funding system works. But how do you define an outcome? Because I actually agree that we should be actually measuring and paying and funding for outcome. And you just said it in passing just before you answered one of the questions, you said patients have an outcome. I think the most important thing, and this is from a First Nations perspective, is patient determined outcomes. Because we have most clinicians, and I'm a nurse and midwife, always got a view on what we think a health outcome is. But we don't set up a system so that it's a patient determined outcome. Now, that's what we're going to pay for. That's what I think is one of the answers. And I could say, optimistically, Queensland Health is starting to look at hybrid models. We are starting that there are some big reform agendas that we currently need to use looking at it. Irrespective of how the way we fund from the common, we're looking internally how to better maximise that, our funding models, which is encouraging. 
Um, thanks, Haley. And so, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll address the outcome issue because I think our outcome is really important. Is outcome to who? Uh, is it outcome to provide a funder or um, patient? Uh, that requires a level of health literacy. And to do that, it means you have to have a level of engagement. You actually have to have a conversation. And um, that I think you have the data. The data enables a conversation because I think there is asymmetry in information. I, I, to be fair to providers, I think there's a, there is an asymmetry in information for a provider. And I go back to what I heard in the last two weeks. A clinician provides what they are proficient at. So, um, if you had data that enabled clinicians to understand where they sit relative to that, that would enable them to engage in them even saying, maybe I need to transition. But the funding has to encourage that, right? Um, and so that means there's now, it requires a system response. It requires a leadership response around how do we use data better to use the data to have a conversation around what is the outcome, then it requires a conversation. Um, so I hope that answers. Yeah, I was going to go to the point of saying you need to have an informed conversation to be able to make it yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that's, that's the argument that I'm advocating for, uh, for democratising um, harm uh, or, the, or the incidence of harm for particular interventions uh, for, say, elective surgery. So that for you, for your age, for your comorbidities, a GP can have an, have an informed conversation with you before you even get a referral. And so I just have to say, there's a cultural element to every person, including black folks, and that's the way of saying that's important in terms of the clinical outcomes. That's yep. never often considered, no matter who they are. All right, um, thank you. I'm mindful of time, so um, please join me in thanking Dan for a, a wonderful talk and, um, yeah. Uh, we now have uh, food outside, and if you'd like to ask further questions, um, please join us. Um, this is the start of an ongoing series in health economics um, that we continue to do. So um, we will use the email registration to um, get in contact with you about the next um, uh, series of events. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you.